video is brought to you by Dr. Borai. Please press on the subscribe button and the bell icon. Hello everyone, this is Abhijit Barai. Uh, over these next few minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, the diagnosis and management of uh, migraine. And I hope that you find this uh, useful. Uh, migraine is a big uh, gray area that uh, we deal with every day. We see hundreds of patients of migraine headache and uh, sometimes they turn out to be uh, some alternative life threatening condition like some subarachnoid hemorrhage or dural venous sinus thrombosis. So it's very important that we have a very good understanding of the diagnosis and treatment so that the patients can be benefited. Uh, and I, I hope that you find this video useful. Uh, in this video, I have got Becky with me who has got some really good understanding and knowledge of uh, migraine. And she's going to help me with this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Becky, for being with us. Hello, everyone. I am Becky. As always, it's a great pleasure to be here. Over the next few minutes, we are going to talk about migraine. Hope you like it. I know how amazing you are. Please press on the subscribe button below and do not forget to click on the bell icon to get regular updates. We will bring to you new exciting videos regularly for your education and entertainment. If you have any burning questions or awesome ideas, please write in the comments section below and we will get back to you as soon as we can. I can assure you that the next few minutes will be very informative and interesting. I will be with you till the end of the video. Let's start, shall we? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so that's, that was a great introduction. So um, at first, what is migraine? We see these uh, migraine uh, all the time in the emergency department and urgent care settings. And um, sometimes, funnily, I tell my junior colleagues that uh, migraine is the headache of the patient, but also it gives a lot of headache to the doctors because there are so many differential diagnoses, so many different um, um, <clears throat> gray areas in the diagnosis of this condition. The management can be variable. There is no blood test to confirm the diagnosis. There is no scan uh, to diagnose it. So it is a gray area. It is a headache for the doctors, and also it is a headache for the patients. Uh, also, uh, it needs to be remembered that migraine is such a condition with not only the headache, but there may be some other different problems. There are some patients who can have just aura without any headache. Still, it is migraine. Sometimes the migraine can present like a stroke. So I think it's very important that we have a very good, solid understanding in the diagnosis and the management or treatment of this condition. Millions of people suffer from this condition and uh, as a physician, this is our duty to help them and that is why this video was prepared. I hope you find this useful. <clears throat> so uh, in the centerpiece of uh, migraine is obviously headache and that is a severe headache. This is the headache which can cause a disability. The patient uh, can come to the hospital or an urgent care setting with a lot of distress and as a physician, we are here to help them. So although the centerpiece of uh, migraine is headache, patient can have some prodromal features, like they can have euphoria, depression, constipation. Um, they can have aura. They can have some visual uh, difficulties. They can have uh, some hemiplegia. They can have some speech problems. That's like a stroke. Uh, but they can have post -room. They can have some headache, but... Uh, only when they suddenly move the head. Of course, they can have some neurological deficit. They can have problems in the motor system, sensory system, auditory system. Most of the patients that I have seen with uh, migraine, they have got severe nausea and vomiting. They're retching. They, they, they get dehydrated. They develop metabolic alkalosis. And they can have photophobia, phonophobia. And because of the photophobia, phonophobia, these patients prefer to lie down in a quiet, dark room and uh, they, uh, they, if, if they sleep very well, usually the headache subsides and the migraine gets better as well. So what I'm trying to tell you is that <clears throat> don't uh, concentrate only on headache. The patient can have a lot of other problems, but the center is the main problem for which the patient will come to the hospital, probably is the headache, but also they can come with the features of a stroke. They can have some metabolic problems like metabolic alkalosis, hypokalemia, hypochloremia, a lot of different problems. Now, uh, before I tell you about the treatment, uh, let's talk about the pathophysiology. And if we understand the pathophysiology, we will be able to understand the treatment process as well. So in the good old days when I was in medical school, we are told, um, not even a polite way, but a very rough way, that um, 
the only way migraine happens is because of some vascular problem. Usually the patients have got severe vasodilatation that causes pressure over the meninges. And the meninges is so sensitive that if you press on it, it will hurt. And uh, subsequent studies did, uh, did not find enough evidence to support that theory. So it turned out that was the bogus theory. So vascular theory uh, does not exist. It is a rubbish theory. So just forget it. What nowadays the, uh, the scientists and the researchers talk, talk, uh, talk us about is the cortical spreading theory. What it says is that in the surface of the brain, especially in the cerebral cortex, there is some depolarization. And that depolarization can spread to the surface of the brain and to the meninges. When the meninges is affected, they can have some inflammation and um, that can cause localized headache. It can be pulsatile in nature. Um, and because of some inflammation in the meninges, if we can give some anti-inflammatory tablets like high dose of aspirin or ibuprofen or naproxen, even if you give some steroids like say 10 to 24 milligram of IV dexamethasone or methylprednisolone in that matter, it works like magic. And uh, this inflammation in the meninges subsides and patients get better. So still now, this is the latest theory and usually uh, that is uh, what we believe that that is the cause. A very uh, important role is played by the trisaminal nerve ganglion. The afferent fibers of the trisaminal nerve ganglion can be affected and so patient develops headache along the distribution of the trisaminal nerve. Please don't get confused with trisaminal um, neuralgia. That is a different thing. It is uh, the trisaminal nerve afferent fibers in the ganglion that are responsible for migraine headache. A very important concept in migraine is a sensitization. So there are a lot of triggers like the stress, hormonal conditions, uh, starvation, uh, sleep disturbances. Now, if those triggers develop migraine, usually the trigger is very high threshold. With time, it turns out that same stress can cause migraine headache with a small intensity of stress. So basically the threshold level decreases. And uh, uh, so if we understand the sensitization theory, then we can understand the treatment as well. So one of the treatment modality is desensitization. So we can expose the patients in a very systematic way to the triggers and gradually increase the trigger so that the patient gets desensitized. And that is the way of treatment of migraine headache as well. It was found in different uh, MRI scans that uh, the patient's uh, brain, cerebral cortex, in some areas, they are thicker than other people who don't have migraine. On the other hand, in some other areas of the brain of the patients with migraine have got thinner gray matter than the people who don't have migraine. So the patients who have got migraine have got some structural uh, abnormality or structural differences from the people who don't have migraine. Serotonin plays a very important role in the causation of migraine. So usually if the patient has got def deficiency of serotonin, they develop migraine. And then the treatment is very simple. Give some medication that can increase the serotonin level. For example, you can give uh, citalopram, acetalopram, this is SSRI, or venlafaxine, which is SNRI, or you can give tricyclic antipressin, like amitriptyline or nortriptyline. That, that can increase the serotonin level, and if the serotonin level increases, then the migraine headache improves. So these are a few theories. Uh, still, uh, they are some of them are not proven. Most of them are proven. Vascular theory is out of box. Uh, nobody believes this uh, vascular theory anymore. Now, a little bit about epidemiology. Uh, Becky, could you please tell us a little bit about epidemiology of migraine, please? Thank you. Migraine is a common disorder that affects up to 12% of the general population. It is more frequent in women than in men. The migraine attacks occur in up to 17% of women and 6% of men each year. Migraine without aura is the most common type, accounting for 75 to 80 percent of the cases. Migraine is most common in those aged between 30 and 39 years. Migraine also tends to run in families. In fact, the incidence of migraine is three times higher in patients with a family history of migraine than those without a family history of migraine. Although not fatal, migraine is a major cause of disability. It is ranked second worldwide in 2016 among all the diseases with respect to years of life lived with disability. Migraine may have association with some other diseases as well. 
The data from several retrospective nationwide cohort studies in Taiwan, all from the same group of investigators, suggest that migraine is a potential risk factor for Bell's palsy, sensorineural hearing loss, and oculomotor cranial nerve palsies. However, independent reports are needed to confirm these associations. Excellent. Uh, so that is a very short uh, but uh, very crispy epidemiology. That is all we need to know. Um, now the clinical features, um, there is this uh, breath mnemonic uh, pound. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about this. So if you remember pound, then you will be able to remember uh, the clinical features of migraine as well. There is this great mnemonic to remember the clinical features of migraine. It is pound as in pounding headache. Here, P stands for pulsatile. O stands for onset 4 to 72 hours. U for unilateral. N for nausea and vomiting. D for disability. When you struggle to remember the features of migraine, just remember pound. Easy PC. Excellent. So that's the great mnemonic pound, and that is how the patient presents. Uh, as you can see here, there is a pulsatile headache on the right side of the head, and uh, usually uh, it lasts for 72 hours. If the headache lasts for more than 72 hours, think about some other alternative diagnosis. It can be uh, a brain tumor, it can be intracranial hemorrhage, it can be dural venous venous thrombosis. So keep an open mind. Uh, so most of the time, the headache does not last more than 72 hours. If it lasts more than 72 hours, also it can be chronic migraine, which is completely different territory altogether. Usually this is unilateral. If it is bilateral, band-like, think about tension headache. As I mentioned earlier, that most of the patients have got nausea vomiting and uh, they can have metabolic alkalosis. They can have electrolyte abnormality like hypokalemia or hypochloremia. And it is so disabling that these migraine headaches can affect the personal life, the social life, the occupational life. Um, so uh, many hours, many work hours of the people can be affected very badly if they have got migraine. So this is, we need to, as an employer, I'm pretty sure the, the well-being sector should look after the employees if they have got migraine because uh, many hours of work can be affected uh, by migraine. Um, now, in case of the migraine, there are four phases who come usually subsequently. The first uh, phase that the patient develops is the prodrome. So in the prodrome, the patient develops uh, euphoria or nos they can have depression, they can have constipation. When the patient develops prodrome, they know that they are going to have headache within the next few minutes to few hours. Um, and that is the alarm bell. And they can, they can, uh, they can know that, oh, I, I need to go to the bed or I need to lie down or I need to take some rest in a dark, quiet environment. Now, one of the important and very confusing thing is the aura. There are four different types of aura and we'll talk about it in the next slide. Now, aura can be really challenging. Sometimes a patient can have so much bad symptom that uh, it looks like a stroke. For example, in hemiplegic migraine, when they develop one side of the body gets paralyzed. Visual aura is the commonest type of aura, but uh, the aura should not last for more than 60 minutes. If those symptoms last for more than 60 minutes, think about something else. It may be stroke, it may be brain tumor, it can be intracranial hemorrhage or something else. The phase three, which occurs after the aura, is headache. It is the usual conventional uh, teaching. However, in the recent studies, it show that uh, when the patient has got aura, the headache may be there as well. Now, headache, as we have mentioned earlier in the previous slide, that is pulsatile, unilateral, and usually from four to 72 hours, they can have nausea vomiting associated with the headache, and they can have disability as well. Now, the last phase is the prodrome. When the headache subsides, if the patient suddenly moves the head to one direction, then they can have a severe localized headache on the same area where they have got the migraine headache. So uh, if we can understand these uh, four phases, that makes the life a lot easier to diagnose a patient with migraine. This is the classic presentation of migraine when they have got this prodrome, aura, headache, and postdrome subsequently. Now, there are four different types of aura. Aura is a symptom. It's not a sign. It's a symptom. The patient will have some visual problem, auditory problem, or some sensory problem or motor problem. These are the symptoms that can they have. They can have positive uh, aura or negative aura. 
positive aura, for example, they can have some bright spot in the visual field. That is a visual positive aura. The negative visual aura is the visual field will get obliterated. They will not be able to see something. So the visual field will disappear completely. But again, this aura should not last for more than 60 minutes. In case of the auditory aura, it is not as common as the visual aura. Again, it can be positive or negative. For example, if the patient has got some dyspecia, difficulty in speaking, uh, that can be one of these type of aura. Sensory aura, so they can have tingling sensation, they can have allodynia, they can have some anesthesia type of presentation. Um, but again, sensory aura is not as that common like the visual aura. A very rare type of aura is the motor aura. They can have hemiplegia, they can have, um, they can have some increased uh, tone, sometimes reflex can be increased. So this is some weird and wonderful things that can present. And if the patient is known to have migraine, they are, all, they, are, they are already habituated with aura. Now, with regards to the aura, one needs to be uh, very clear about it that most patients don't have aura. 75% of the patients do not have any aura. They have migraine straight away, migraine headache. However, 20% of the patient, 25% of the patients will have aura. Um, most of the time it is visual aura, but they can have other aura as well. Another important thing is that the patients do not have multiple different types of aura at the same time. So if somebody has got visual aura, they may not have sensory aura. If they have got motor aura, they may not have the visual, auditory, or sensory aura. So this is a very interesting concept about aura. It's a very gray area. The people who have got migraine, they know what it is. Because it is a symptom, not a sign, it can be very difficult to comprehend by the clinicians. Now, uh, one type of visual aura is something called the fortification spectrum. So what happens is in the visual field, they develop a C-shaped zigzag line, and then gradually that visual field gets obliterated and the whole visual field gets obliterated. Gradually, within 60 minutes time, the visual field comes back. If the visual field does not come back, think about something else. It is not probably migrate, it's probably something else. So you went to a holiday and you were watching the sunset and suddenly you notice that there is a little zigzag line which is expanding and the whole visual field will get obliterated. This is uh, the uh, fortification spectrum. Uh, another holiday you went there and suddenly you, the whole visual field has gone. So that is the uh, fortification spectrum, which is the type of visual aura. Now, whenever we talk about uh, aura and headache, think about a condition that not that commonly found, but it can happen. A patient can have just aura, but no headache. Very rare, but it can happen. And uh, Becky is going to talk about this uh, topic a little bit in details. Aura without headache is a special phenomenon that we need to be aware of. Migraine aura without headache manifests as isolated aura unaccompanied by headache. This is also known as migraine equivalent and aphalgic migraine. In a Danish case study, about 4% had exclusively migraine aura without headache. Auras without headache may be confused with transient ischemic attacks, especially when they first present in older patients as late-life migraine accompaniments. The late-life migraine accompaniments are symptoms related to the onset after the age of 50 years of migraine aura without headache. The most common symptoms are visual auras, followed by sensory auras such as paresthesia, speech disturbances, and motor auras, such as weakness or paralysis. The most common presentation is gradual evolution of aura symptoms with spread of transient neurologic deficits over several minutes and serial progression from one symptom to another. Excellent. That's a very good summary of the aura without headache. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are some triggers that can that can that can cause the headache. It's not the cause; it's the trigger. So basically, it's just uh, uh, starting the headache or starting the migraine. The commonest, about 85% of the patients will have some emotional stress. In females, the commonest uh, trigger is hormonal conditions, uh, hormonal fluctuation. If the patient is starving, that can be a very common cause of uh, the migraine trigger as well. On the other spectrum, if the patient drinks some red wine, not the white wine, but the red wine, if the patient eats some uh, chocolates, that can be a trigger, but not that frequently or not, not that severe like uh, non-eating or starvation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, sleep disturbances, that can cause uh, the triggering effect of headache in about 50% of the patients. So 
the least common cause is exercise and sexual activity, probably about, uh, I think it is about 5% cases, it is the trigger. There are different subtypes of migraine. So uh, migraine can occur with aura in 25% of the cases, in 75% of the cases, there is no aura. There is a type of uh, brainstem aura, which is usually found in case of children between or young people between seven years and 20 years of age. They can have the brainstem manifestations. They can have uh, the, uh, the uh, ataxia and the cerebellar symptoms. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that their patient can have hemiplegic migraine, where one side of the body gets paralyzed, just like a stroke. But it's not a stroke, it's a, mig it's a migraine. Ocular migraine or retinal migraine is a condition where the visual disturbances can be found. And um, chronic migraine is a type of migraine when the patient has got migraine more than 15 days every month for more than three months. Vestibular migraine is the migraine when the patient develops uh, vertigo, uh, nystagmus, this type of presentation. Uh, menstruation may be associated with migraine, and there may be various types of complications. For example, patient can have um, uh, status migranosus, that is a complication. Scissors can occur, even cerebral infraction can occur. So during migraine headache, there may be so much vascular involvement that uh, that patient can have actually a cerebral infraction. Now, um, the international so international classification of the headache disorder three has got a classification system. Uh, on the basis of which um, the diagnosis of migraine can be done. There are two different varieties. In 25% uh, of the cases, uh, they have got a migraine with uh, aura, and in 75% of the cases, patient can have migraine without aura. Now, there are, uh, they, there are five steps in the diagnosis of uh, migraine according to the ICDH uh, classification, ICHD classification. Now, first of all, uh, out of this uh, classification, we need to have um, B, C, and D at least five attacks. If the patient has just one attack, we cannot diagnose it as a migraine. So migraine attack should last for four to seven hours, as we have mentioned earlier, and at least two of the following should be present. These are unilateral location, pulsatile in nature. They can have moderate to severe intensity and aggravated by or causing the avoidance of routine physical activity like walking or climbing stairs. So at least two of these four things should be present and out of these uh, two, like nausea, vomiting and photophobia, phonophobia, at least one should be present. So these are the three characteristic features which should be present at least five times and the patient should not have any differential diagnosis like a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a rural venous sinus thrombosis or temporal arteritis, acute angle closure glaucoma, these are the differential diagnosis and we need to exclude them. Um, so as you can understand that the patient needs to have at least five attacks to diagnose the migraine. So MRC medicine is not the place that we can diagnose migraine. GPs can do that. Urgent care physicians can do that. Um, unfortunately, MRC department is not the best place to diagnose migraine. Similarly, if the patient has got migraine with aura, which is found in 25% of the patients, uh, there are the four uh, steps in the diagnosis. So the first of all, one or more of the following fully reversible aura symptoms should be present. As we have mentioned, they can have visual uh, aura, sensory aura, speech or language aura, motor aura, brainstem aura, and retinal aura. At least one should be present. Number two, at least three of the following characteristics should be present. These are at least one aura symptom spreads gradually over more than five minutes. Two or more symptoms occur in succession. Each individual aura symptom lasts for five to 60 minutes. And at least one aura symptom is unilateral. At least one aura symptom is positive. And the aura is accompanied by or followed within 60 minutes by headache. So at least three of these uh, six will be present. And uh, at least one of the aura should be present and there is no differential diagnosis. So if these uh, characteristic features are present, then we can diagnose a migraine with aura. So emergency medicine department may be, or other urgent care center may be a place where we can uh, diagnose this, but again, they need to have at least two attacks. If the patient has got the first attack, then we cannot diagnose it. But if the patient comes within, within a few hours, a few days with a second attack, then we can diagnose it. So we need to keep a very open mind that this is probably beyond the expertise of uh, the emergency department. Now, when it uh, comes to diagnosis, we don't have any blood test, we don't have any imaging, we don't have any other investigations. What we can do is 
use those uh, ICHD3 uh, diagnostic criteria. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, that emergency medicine may not be the best place. Uh, either it is urgent care setting or GP practice where this diagnostic criteria can be used for the diagnosis of migraine. We can do some physical examinations to see if there any fever, is there any neck stiffness, is there any uh, focal neurological deficit to exclude or rule out the differential diagnosis. There is no physical examination to confirm the uh, migraine headache, but we can use the physical examination to rule out the differential diagnosis. Now, with regards to the neuroimaging, there, there, are, there is no neuroimaging to confirm a migraine. Again, we can do neuroimaging in certain conditions to rule out the differential diagnosis. And Becky is going to talk about the neuroimaging in a few seconds. Becky, would you be happy to do that? Thank you. Usually, no neuroimaging is required for the diagnosis or management of migraine. However, there are certain situations where neuroimaging is warranted. For example, the first or worst headache in a patient with migraine may need a CT head to rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Similarly, neuroimaging is required in a recent significant change in the pattern, frequency, or severity of headaches. In addition, new or unexplained neurologic symptoms or signs, headache always on the same side, headaches not responding to treatment, new onset headaches after age 50 years, new onset headaches in patients with cancer or HIV infection are few of the conditions that warrant neuroimaging such as a CT head. If there are associated symptoms and signs such as fever, stiff neck, papilledema, cognitive impairment, or personality change, then that may also need neuroimaging. Excellent. So, one of the things we need to be very careful about is that if there is new onset headache after 50 years, it can be temporal arteritis, it can be brain tumor. So, think about something bad. Um, if the patient's got fever, think about meningoencephalitis. If the patient's got neck stiffness, there may be meningoencephalitis or intracranial hemorrhage, like subarachnoid hemorrhage. If there is first or worst headache of life, don't think about migraine at first. Think about subarachnoid hemorrhage at first. So these are the few conditions where we can do neuroimaging. Most of the time we do the CT head uh, without contrast, but sometimes CTA may be required. Uh, we might have to do MRI or MRA scan as well. So we need to have a very broad uh, idea about the diagnosis. It's not very straightforward and um, most uh, of the time it's very challenging to diagnose this condition. Now, in case of the differential diagnosis, there is a big list, but we can divide them into two broad categories. One is the primary headache, and the other one is the secondary headache. Primary headache is the headache is happening only in the head, and secondary headache is the patient has got some other problems. So it's maybe meningitis, it's maybe subdural hemorrhage. So usually the primary headaches are migraine headache, tension headache, which is like a band-like feeling associated with stress. But think about it, that migraine also is associated with stress. So stress does not necessarily mean that this is a tension headache. Patient can have migraine headache with, due to the stress as well. And about 85% of the cases, the trigger for migraine is stress. Cluster headache usually comes in clusters. Now, secondary headache, it can be because of subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, meningoencephalitis. They have got neck stiffness, photophobia, reduced level of consciousness. Patient can have cervical artery dissection. For example, the vertebral artery dissection or carotid artery dissection. I have seen quite a few patients who came to the hospital with neck pain and headache did the CTA and it, found, it turned out the patient has got a vertebral artery dissection or cervical artery, uh, uh, the uh, carotid artery dissection. So again, uh, if the patient comes with headache, uh, very, very carefully you need to evaluate is there any neck problem, is there a neck pain. Uh, usually if the patient has got pain in the back of the neck, it is vertebral artery dissection. And if the pain is in the front of the neck, this is uh, the carotid artery dissection. If the patient has got hello around the visual field or objects in the visual field, if the patient has got uh, examination-wise hagi um, cornea, if the, there is mid dilated pupil, which does not respond very well to light, if there is um, uh, intraocular pressure that is more than 20 millimeter of mercury, think about acute angle closure glaucoma, which can be a site threatening time critical emergency. So these are the patients who need um, uh, early uh, involvement, early review by the ophthalmologist as well. Dinosaur arteritis is a big, big, big area. Especially if the patient has got uh, uh, unilateral headache, more than 50 years of age, and they have got um, maybe some visual disturbances as well, which may be a late sign actually. 
So Zancel arteritis or temporal arteritis, that is a very important differential diagnosis in case of migraine headache as well. Now, whenever it comes to treatment, we can divide them into three categories. Of course, we can give some medications, some tablets like uh, abortive therapy and rescue therapy. We'll talk about it in details. And then we can give a non-pharmacological therapy as well. And they can have some surgical therapy, which is very rarely done. Now, with regards to the abortive therapy, when the patient has got severe headache, then different medications can be given um, to control the symptoms. That is the abortive therapy. Rescue therapy is when we prevent the, we try to prevent the occurrence. Um, this is some medication which, uh, which reduces the recurrence of the headache, that is rescue therapy. So this is done when the patient is discharged from the hospital or emergency department or urgent care center. And this, is, this can be taken by the patient themselves, or also we can give it in the hospital. Non-pharmacological therapy, it is uh, used and somewhat it works. I don't have much um, information about it, but yoga, meditation, music, uh, acupuncture can be useful to some patients. Some psychiatric uh, evaluation or psychological therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy that works very well in case of uh, migraine headache. Again, these uh, are the services which can be provided uh, by the GPs or other um, uh, probably non-conventional medical services. Emergency medicine or urgent care center may not be the best place to uh, provide this type of services. Now let's talk about uh, the abortive therapy. So if the patient has got severe headache, then they can, they can have some medications. So initially, in case of mild to moderate attacks, uh, some simple medications can be used. For example, high dose of aspirin or naproxen or uh, ibuprofen. So it is not a single small dose of aspirin, like 100 milligram. Usually these are the patients who need a very high dose of aspirin, like uh, 800 to 1000 milligram. And they can try paracetamol as well. Uh, one gram of paracetamol along with high dose of aspirin that works very well in case of mild to moderate uh, migraine. Uh, please try avoid the opioids because they are not helpful at all. Instead, they have got a lot of different side effects. So avoid uh, the opioids. Even codeine, tramadol, um, they are usually not very effective. Instead, we can try with high dose of NSAI and some paracetamol for mild to moderate attacks. In case of severe attack, however, uh, we can start with those treatment. Uh, we can give a high dose of uh, aspirin or naproxen or ibuprofen. We can give paracetamol. And then on the top of it, we can give some sumatriptan. 50 to 100 milligram of sumatriptan is usually given. The problem with the sumatriptan is that if you give it orally, the patient is already has got nausea vomiting. So probably not a very good idea to give orally. Instead, what we can do is we can give a subcutaneous injection. Six milligram of um, uh, sumatriptan can be given subcutaneously. And sometimes they can be bought uh, as the uh, auto-injector. And the patient can self-administer them. And it's uh, very easy to administer. And usually it works very well. The way sumatriptan works is it increases serotonin in the nervous system. And we, in the pathophysiological uh, part, we have discussed about the role of serotonin. If the serotonin decreases in the nervous system, then the patient develops migraine. So by giving sumatriptan, sumatriptan is a serotonin agonist. So it will bind with the 5 hydroxyribin receptors and, uh, and control the headache of the migraine. Recently, we have started using Ketorolac, 30 milligram IV, which works really, very well. And there are a lot of uh, studies which show that Ketorolac 30 milligram IV is at, as good as, or sometimes even better than the opioids. And uh, many of the centers don't use it, but I don't know why, but usually it works really, very well. Um, as I mentioned, it is better than opioids. And uh, status migraineosis is a condition when uh, patients can have headache for more than uh, 72 hours. And uh, this is the condition which can be quite distressing for the patient. Uh, one way we can treat it is by, like, just like in case of severe headache, we can give sumatriptan, subcutaneously six milligram, and ketorolac can be given, 30 milligram IV. And usually the combination works very well. The, when the patient comes to the urgent care center or emergency medicine departments, they are, have got a distressing type of headache. They can have nausea vomiting. They can be dehydrated. So usually I start with some normal saline, one liter IV slowly. We give some NSAIDs and we give some antiemetics. Personally, I prefer to give metoprolol, um, sorry, uh, metoclopramide. I give um, 10 to 20 milligram of IV metoclopramide. Usually that works very well. Alternatives are we can give some clopromazine. 
uh, 12.5 milligram IV over an hour, or we can give some prochlorprazine 12.5 milligram. Most of the countries, uh, prochlorprazine or stimetil is not uh, authorized to use it intravenously. One of the problems with the antiemetics is that they can cause dystonic reactions. So I give uh, some IV, IV diphenhydramine 12.5 uh, milligram as well. As you mentioned, we can use sumatriptan in case of uh, emergency treatment as well because it is a serotonin agonist. So this is a bundle of care, basically. We can give IV normosaline, NSAIs, some antiemetics, associate along with some IV diphenhydramine, and we can give some sumatriptan. And most of the time, these patients get better with this bundle of treatment. Now, with regards to the steroids, recently they, I have changed my practice. I have started giving some steroids in uh, patients for migraine when I decide that the patient can go home. Now, steroids should not be given in the patients who are coming to the hospital, but it can be given uh, to prevent the recurrence of the migraine. Um, there are a lot of literature in the medical science papers, and these are uh, really available in the, um, in the internet. So this paper was published uh, four or five years ago in the British Medical Journal, and they showed that statistically speaking, uh, IV dexamethasone can be really, really useful, and it prevents the occurrence of, or recurrence rather, of um, migraine headache over the next 72 hours. A similar study was published, uh, this is quite a recent paper, um, so this is five years as well. Uh, so this paper also showed that um, the, if you give IV dexamethasone, um, usually it is anything between 4 milligram to 24 milligram. That works really, very well to the, for the prevention of migraine. Um, and this particular paper actually changed my practice, and I started giving that if, if I am convinced that the patient's migraine has improved and I am going to send the patient home, um, I give some dexamethasone. Usually I give 10 milligram, but sometimes you can give 20, up to 24 milligram as well. And uh, that works really very well in the prevention of uh, migraine. Now, in case of the magnesium, again, this is something not uh, used. I used to, but now I am. I have started doing this. So not in every patient, but there are some group of patients where I use uh, magnesium sulfate. Uh, usually, um, the intravenous magnesium, 10 millimole, can be given IV over an hour uh, in the acute attack on migraine. And we can give oral magnesium as well for prevention of migraine attack. And the, the interesting part is that you can, you can actually, the patients can buy magnesium over the counter. They don't need a, to see a physician and they don't need a prescription. And apparently it was found that the uh, migraine is associated with uh, deficiency of uh, magnesium. So if the patients take oral migraine, or sorry, oral magnesium, um, one tablet every day, usually that uh, can prevent the occurrence of migraine. So in case of the intravenous migraine, the intravenous magnesium that is given for the treatment of acute migraine, that is an abortive therapy. But if the patient takes oral magnesium, that is not an abortive therapy, that is a rescue therapy. Sodium valproate can be given either IV or orally. Similarly, um, uh, just like in magnesium. So it was found that if we give IV sodium valproate one gram that can actually treat the acute severe migraine attacks. On the other hand, if we give oral sodium valproate like 400 milligram, that can prevent the occurrence of migraine. So this type of medication, the patients need to see the doctor and the doctors need to evaluate the patient and think about the benefits and the risk. And if the doctors feel that this is uh, beneficial, rather than the risk, then this can be given to the patients as well. So let me repeat it again. If we give sodium valproate IV, that can be useful in acute migraine attacks. And in case of the prevention of migraine, oral sodium valproate can be used. And there is a lot of literature, a lot of medical research on this topic. Uh, this particular paper was published uh, pretty recently. It was published just last year. Um, and this is the latest information that we are getting these days that uh, sodium valproate works in case of the acute migraine attack as an abortive therapy and also as a rescue therapy. Now, uh, opioids, that is a big, big gray area. Should we give opioids to the patients with migraine? Probably not. There, there is no evidence to suggest that opioid actually work for migraine attack. The, there is a lot of literature again. It's, it suggests that uh, opioids have a lot of side effects. It can affect the patient's breathing. 
it can cause allergic reaction including anaphylaxis it can cause constipation a uh, patient can get addicted it can affect their day to day activity their physical activity their occupational health the, their um, inter social interaction so opioids are not the best drug for the treatment of migraine however if the patient is in lot of headache and we, we are not sure whether this is migraine or something else then sometimes opioids can be given i usually not try to give any opioids in a patient with migraine there are a lot of literature again uh, this paper was published a few years a couple, a couple of years ago and it it was an american paper who tried to identify what is the how the migraine is treated and what is the um, frequency of the use of opioids in the treatment of migraine and the authors found that still the amount of opioids that, we, that they are giving in the us in america the hospitals that is huge in earlier days they used to use mepiridine or pethidine they have reduced the use of pethidine however they have increased the use of oxycodone in other countries like in the uk in australia in new zealand uh, again opioid is not used commonly because the main problem with opioid is it can cause medication overuse headache so instead of causing actually instead of helping the patient we can actually cause harm to the patient if we give opioids so try not to give opioids instead of giving opioids give something else you can give iv ketorolac you can give a high dose of nsaids you can give paracetamol you can give sumatriptan argotamine can be used as well in certain cases um, but not the opioids now let's talk about the medication overuse headache uh, becky has got uh, some interesting information uh, we'll talk about uh, the uh, medication overuse headache uh, in the couple of sec a couple of uh, slides so first of all this patient has got a history of headache they take medications and the headache gets worse and not only worse it is staying there for more than 15 days every month for 3 months or more so it is a disabling chronic headache thanks to those medications they are taking the commonest medication that is associated with medication overuse headache is opioids even sumatriptan even uh, these uh, common medications that are used for migraine they can cause medication overuse headache the only drug which is least associated with medication overuse headache is nsaids we, that is why we are advocating give uh, nsaids like high dose of aspirin you can give ibuprofen 800 mg or naproxen these are the common nsaids which are used for uh, migraine headache uh, but again as i mentioned sumatriptan opioids and there is a big no because that can cause medication overuse headache now these are the patients who develop severe headache especially when they wake up from sleep any physical exercise that can cause their headache they can have gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea vomiting and they can have like withdrawal symptoms they develop restlessness anxiety irritability poor concentration now the treatment can be very, very tricky and it is a, it is not a single shot treatment there is no specific treatment for the medication overuse headache it takes time it takes several uh, visits to the physicians the first step is the patient education they need to know that um, taking the medication actually is causing them harm rather than benefit so patient education is very important and it is a shared decision making process between the doctor and the patient um, once we try to educate the patients we try to reduce the medication that they are taking and if they that first step fails then we go for the step 2 which is migraine prevention and that is when we can give the sodium valproate as a as a as a rescue therapy we can give some steroids for a couple of days if the patient does not have headache but most of the time the patient have got headache so steroids may not be an option and if the step 2 fails then we can go for detoxification and for detoxification either the patient needs to be admitted to the hospital or it can be done as outpatient clinic again medication is, overuse headache is yeah. defined by the international classification of headache disorders as a headache in patients with a pre-existing primary headache disorder that occurs on more than 15 days per month for more than 3 months it is caused by the overuse of medication intended for acute or symptomatic headache treatment the prevalence of medication overuse headache in the general population is around 1%. But, the condition is much more common in people with headache, in particular chronic migraine. 
The phenotype of the headache in medication overuse headache depends on the initial primary headache and the type of overused acute medication. The treatment of medication overuse headache is performed in three steps. Number one, educating patients about the relationship between frequent intake of acute headache medication and medication overuse headache with the aim to reduce intake of acute medication. Number two, the initiation of migraine prevention, such as topiramate or onobotulinum toxina in migraine, in patients who fail step one. Number three, detoxification on an outpatient basis or in a day hospital or in patient setting depending on severity and comorbidities. The success rate of treatment is around 50 to 70 percent, although patients whose medication overuse headache is associated with opioid overuse have higher relapse rates. In all patients with medication overuse headache, relapse rates can be reduced by patient education and care in the follow-up period. Excellent. So that's really good. So medication overuse headache uh, can be a real uh, pain. Um, and we need to understand this concept. We need to know how to identify it and how to treat it. Right, so let's talk about rescue treatment. Rescue treatment is when the patient's uh, headache subsides. We have decided to send the patient home. We can give some medications so that, that uh, the, the, the headache does not recur. One of the medications that I have discussed about is dexamethasone IV. We have discussed about the role of magnesium. We have discussed about sodium valproate. But in addition to that, we can give some beta blockers. So atenolol, metoprolol, propranolol, they can be very useful. There are some calcium cellular blockers like verapamil that, uh, that can be given in rescue therapy. As we have mentioned that um, one of the reasons the patient develops migraine is because of serotonin reduction in their brain. So we can give tricyclic antipressin or SSRI, SNRI to increase the serotonin in the brain tissue and that can uh, control the headache. Uh, Anticonvulsants, uh, sodium valproate is a big, big, big uh, topic here, and topiramate can be used as well as a rescue therapy. So let me repeat it again uh, for the rescue therapy that is given to prevent the occurrence of migraine headache. We can give some beta blockers, calcium cell blockers, antidepressants, and some anticonvulsants. Again, uh, the patient should not take this on their own. Uh, they need to see a doctor, they need to be evaluated, they need to uh, identify the risk benefit ratio, and uh, then the doctor can prescribe these medications. There are some new techniques which uh, came to play recently. One is the botulinum toxins. I know one neurologist who specializes in botulinum toxin and um, apparently it works very well. It works like magic. And um, I know a few patients who are known to that particular neurologist and they give this botulinum toxin with success. One of the new techniques that I have learned recently and I practice to the patients as well, that is occipital nerve block. So if we put some uh, local anesthetic in the occipital area, just on the side of the greater occipital protuberance, it works very well in certain patients, especially those patients where the upper cervical root nerve are affected. Uh, sphenopalatine ganglion block, that is uh, the injection inside the nose. Um, if the sphenopalatine ganglion can be blocked by some uh, local anesthetic, usually the, the patients uh, uh, feel better. Magnesium has got a big role, as we have mentioned. Either you can give IV magnesium sulfate for acute attack or oral magnesium for the uh, prevention as a rescue therapy. One of the things uh, that is uh, I, I should have mentioned earlier is that if the patient has got a good sleep, the migraine, most of the time, it resolves. So melatonin has got a very important role in the uh, control of the headache. So if the patient has got some melatonin, they have got a very good sleep. And when they wake up, the headache may subside. With the exception of the um, medication of use headache, where when they wake up, the headache even uh, gets worse. Uh, so if the patient's headache gets worse when they wake up in case of migraine headache, think about the uh, medication of use headache. Now, there are some non-pharmacological treatment, as we have mentioned. Acupuncture has got some role to play. Yoga, meditation, uh, that has got some important role. And um, you can go to uh, India. There are a lot of centers for yoga and meditation. You can go to the Himalayas, spend a few days and have some good holiday and your headache may subside permanently. There is some music that you can listen to. And of course, uh, the psychotherapist or uh, psychiatrist can help uh, the, some of the patients with the cognitive behavioral therapy. There is like a tense machine they use this um, nowadays, uh, something called the transcutaneous supraorbital nerve stimulation, and it works very well as well. 
uh, I have given uh, some brief summary of this uh, condition. So as the time progresses, the triggers can have low threshold in causing the migraine. And the desensitization technique is to expose the patient to the same trigger in a small uh, increments, and that can reduce the uh, migraine headache. So let's uh, summarize everything. And uh, Becky is waiting eagerly to talk about the summary of migraine. Uh, Becky, go for it, please. Thank you. Okay, everyone. It is time to wrap up now. So, migraine is a disabling condition. Although the headache is the centerpiece of migraine, there may be migraine without headache too. There are various types of migraine such as migraine without aura, migraine with aura, hemiplegic migraine, retinal migraine, menstruation migraine, chronic migraine etc. There are four phases of migraine. These are, number one the prodromal phase, number two aura, number three headache and number four postrome. Remember the mnemonic pound for migraine. P for pulsatile, O for onset 4 to 72 hours, U for unilateral, N for nausea vomiting and D for disabling. Unfortunately, there is no blood test or imaging techniques to confirm the diagnosis of migraine. The diagnosis is based on history and clinical examination. However, there are some conditions which warrant urgent neuroimaging such as sudden onset severe headache, immunodepression, history of HIV or malignancy, age more than 50 years. Migraine treatment has two options. First is the abortive therapy with paracetamol, NSAIDs, triptans and ergotamines. Second is the rescue therapy with beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and anti-epileptic drugs. Steroids such as intravenous dexamethasin 10 to 24 mg reduces the recurrent visits of migraine patients. When caring for the migraine patients, we need to keep an open eye for the differential diagnoses such as subarachnoid hemorrhage, dural venous sinus thrombosis, mm -hmm. meningitis and space-occupying brain lesions. Perfect. Migraine can be challenging to diagnose and treat. However, a systematic approach may be very useful. Excellent. Very good summary, uh, Becky. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, so we have used uh, quite a few documents. Uh, that in up to date, there are a couple of uh, paper, a couple of papers, who um, are really very useful uh, for those of you who are interested. Rosen Mercy Medicine has got several pages of information about uh, migraine. There are some latest uh, papers from uh, Friedman, Coleman, and um, there are some uh, literature reviews, systematic reviews, and meta analysis who uh, actually give us some latest uh, comprehensive uh, medical literature uh, about uh, migraine diagnosis and management. If you're interested, you can go through those literature. The PDF files can be available freely in the internet. All right. So if you've got any further questions about the diagnosis and treatment of migraine, please drop me a line. And uh, uh, Becky will be very happy to send you a, a reply. Um, so it's a time to uh, say goodbye. Thank you very much for your time that you have invested in uh, watching this video. If you have got any further question, please come, uh, let me let us know. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Becky, for being with us. Okay, folks. Thank you for watching the video. Hope you have enjoyed the video. You are so awesome. If you find it useful, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and share it with others. Please write comments below the video. For every comment that you write, positive or negative, I will personally give a cookie to my cat Lucy. <laughs> I promise I will do. If you have any burning questions, constructive suggestions or some awesome ideas, please get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Your comments and suggestions are very important to us. You can contact us through email, Twitter or Dr. Barai's webpage. Thanks once again. See you soon. Bye for now.